Broadcasting live from Mean Girls Soho, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Seamus Connolly. And I'm Garrett Strother, actually in the intro this week. Hey! Welcome yeah, we back. Had... Glad to have you. Thank you, thank you. We had a little bit of technical difficulties last week. We unfortunately skipped over our full thoughts on the Flash trailer, the Batman trailer, the Galena Hutchins tragedy obviously still very much on our minds and in the news i think we caught the end of our uncharted trailer talk is that right seamus yeah we got i I did a little bit of surgery on our audio files and i i got what i could for for our thoughts on the uncharted trailer which i think i thought was a pretty good little runway if not a little too short sadly but I'm sure this isn't the last time we'll talk about any of the things that we kind of had to miss out on in full from last week. Yeah, we'll certainly talk about all three of those trailers. We'll do those for the show, I'm certain. And let's get into this week's news, shall we? Starting right off the bat with some pretty awesome news, I would say. Uh, Brendan Fraser is joining the Batgirl movie as the villain Firefly. The Renaissance is in full force i can't believe brendan fraser is single-handedly dragging the dc universe out of the depths i would say he's apparently incredible on doom patrol firefly i think is a very cool character that i i have a very vague awareness of that i mean brendan fraser as a villain i think is gonna be incredible to see especially with a lot of the tech the high tech stuff that firefly has I'm very curious about which version of Firefly they're going to go with, because in the 60s, I don't know a ton about the character, but I know that there's a, a shift, right? That in the 60s, he's more of this, like, he uses illusions and lighting effects to... Like uh, a Mysterio style? A kind of Mysterio style, discombobulate people while he robs banks or whatever. But <laughs> the modern incarnation, the version that's been on Batman the Animated Series and in the comics and in the Arkham games, is like this really crazy pyromaniac like a burned up freddy krueger style burn victim who has like flamethrowers and armor that makes them fireproof and a a cool mask i also have no idea what the tone of this film is gonna be me neither i'm very curious about how they're gonna be playing these uh straight to hbo feature movies especially with you know more updates like this building out the cast larger we we know it's not like Snyderverse stuff, right? This is like its own independent verse, oh, or is this I, this yeah. not even connected to like the CW any any of that jazz? It's just it's from scratch. We're getting like Blue Beetle and Batgirl. Are those even connected? It wouldn't surprise me, but I think DC has finally learned to do one-off stuff, and then if they need to connect them later, they can just do it. I don't care if they do that. I think that's actually a better way to do things instead of trying to shoehorn in a connected universe where maybe one hasn't quite developed yet. So I'm I'm definitely looking forward to this Batgirl movie more now just because, I mean, Brendan Fraser alone would get me to sit down and watch it. But the fact that it's a, a lesser used villain, I think, is is very cool. And I hope they don't kill him off in one and maybe we'll get to see him... Uh, in the expanded universe if they decide to go that route. I'm assuming he's going to be the main villain, I guess. I d- it's possible they could be doing more than one villain in this movie. I hope he's the main one. I think he deserves that that top villain billing. Plus, Firefly, I think, is a compelling enough villain to support being the primary antagonist of a movie like this. I'd like to see who else is going to be joining these ranks for this movie, but... If all I know is that Brendan Fraser is going to be the villain, main or otherwise, I, I'm i excited. Now, on to the trailer for Disney Pixar's First Man. <laughs> yeah, it really, did the, it really gave that vibe, huh? There's a new movie, Lightyear, coming out, which I want to get your take on first, Seamus, because I, I fear I lack the ability to be impartial about things related <laughs> to Buzz Lightyear. Well, this trailer was definitely interesting. I, I'm i interested to see where they go with it. I ultimately want more connections to Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, the animated series. I want as many connections to that as possible, if, if I could. They're really not showing a ton in this trailer besides just, like, big, oval-headed <laughs> Chris Evans, 
But I'm still cautiously optimistic, especially if quick podcasting call drop, Tim Allen is Zerg. I will, I will be, I'll be very happy with that. You think they're That's gonna the do Zerg? You think there's gonna be a you Zerg? You don't think in this they're movie? gonna do Zerg? That's what's weird to me. They're playing it so grounded. They're playing it so crazy grounded. I'm very confused by it because he's clearly supposed to be a toy based off of you know this kind of buck rogers cartoon sure like, sure it's star wars he's got a de- like zerg has a death star that's the whole bit he's his father right yeah the buzz lightyear star command series always played into that you know that's what i liked about mm-hmm. that this seems to indicate that buzz lightyear is some kind of like a neil armstrong figure in the toy story universe and on the one hand, I don't need to get bogged down in lore and canon and all those other dirty words that we are so hyper-fixated <laughs> on now. Sure, sure. And I sure. want, you know, creators to make the films that they want to make the, and chase the ideas that interest them. But also as somebody who has a, a decades-long infatuation, if not obsession, with this character, I am confused about the tone that they're going for. And if Disney Pixar wanted to make this, like, grounded space movie why they didn't just do it and not have to make it buzz lightyear that's to me that's where my hope lies actually it's like it does seem way more grounded like in the trailer it looks like it's he's the first manned ship around the sun is that what i saw <laughs> that t- that seems to be the indication <laughs> yes but like to me the fact that it is buzz lightyear and that we do get little flashes of like robots and like aliens right we see we see some alien life in this trailer just a bit i didn't catch any i did see the zerg bots but i didn't see any aliens that i i only watched the trailer once though or yeah i guess me too maybe i'm misremembering but like there are sci-fi elements sprinkled in there enough to think that it's almost like there's buzz lightyear of star command is what andy from toy story watched and this is the gritty semi-grounded reboot of that show in universe college age andy is gonna watch Lightyear and be like damn i shouldn't have given my toys away to bonnie it's gonna That's... run way into the zerg stuff and the evil empire and it's gonna be a franchise of Lightyear movies that's why I wish we weren't doing this, because all it is is bogging us down in... Yeah, yeah. Well, how, did, how does the canon work? Um, So in-universe, when Buzz Lightyear, you know... <laughs> it also makes me feel like that we're a lot less likely to get the animated series on Disney+, Plus if this is, like, replacing oh, yeah. it, right? Like, if this is new Buzz Lightyear canon stupid phrase right there again, but that would make me ultimately very sad if they were, like, trying to full shift away from that fun almost parody of star wars and star trek battlestar galactica all that mashed up into into one but then again i still have that hope that it's going to be like a cool way to do i feel like they showed us so little in this trailer specifically because once they get to the zerg lore or the who's what's the robot guy's name in the show xr xr he's gonna totally show up the big red guy's gonna be there booster Booster's gonna be there for sure by the end, and it's gonna be... They do that stupid little Avengers cut to black at the end with the two infinity. And I hate that, off. too. I just hate... I just... Ugh. Like, we know what it is. It's not even as obscure as Avengers Assemble, like, back when Avengers 2012 came out. Like, we... like It's a phrase we know they're gonna say. It's stupid to tease it out that much. On the one hand, I blindly love Buzz Lightyear and I love Chris <laughs> Evans and I'm excited for that element of it but there's very little in this trailer as a Buzz Lightyear fan that got me excited for the implications of it that got me excited for the plot of it I don't want this like weird grounded Damien Chazelle <laughs> stuff I don't I don't like care a tempered looking out of a window of a space station with a dramatic reflection in Buzz Lightyear's eyes or whatever. What if there's like a part where he lands on a thing and there's a tunnel full of spikes and uh, a thing where he has to like jump on various platforms that fall. What you're describing is a worse version of the opening of Toy Story 2. <laughs> exactly. Like that's the thing. I don't want it to just be empty nostalgia. I want it to be this fun space adventure that it doesn't seem like it is. It seems like it's relying way too heavily on this, like, intertextual iconography. Yeah. 
Well, it's going to pair I... up very nicely when they release the Inside Lewin Davis Woody movie in a couple years. And it's like <laughs> him trying to sell Woody's Roundup. Um, <laughs> Bullseye is the cat's name. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. At the very least, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about Lightyear, but I'm also very interested to see how they're going to build out that cast with, like, they just dropped Chris Evans' name, and that's pretty much it, even mm, though... They they told us during back during, um, whatever it's called, Disney Investor Oh, Day, yeah, the big info dump. I want to be excited for this movie. I'm just not. And I won't lie and say I didn't get emotional during the trailer, but that's what that trailer was designed to do. Yeah, they're targeting you, Garrett. They made this movie to make you buy a ticket, even if you don't want to. Yeah, that is, it's true. It is simply true. <laughs> yeah. If it's better than Toy Story 4, I'll be happy. That's the lowest bar imaginable. <laughs> I know. But yeah. <laughs> exactly. Shall we move on to our main segment, though, Seamus? Let's do it. Today's main segment, we're going to be covering Edgar Wright's new film, Last Night in Soho, which I liked. I'll, I'll say I'll say it like that. How about you, Seamus? <laughs> I love the tone, because I also say... I will say I also liked it, dot, dot, dot. It, it was very beautifully shot. I got my little twinges of Edgar Wright editing sprinkled in here and there, and I thought that the performances were absolutely stellar. I just think maybe the some of the messaging is a little cloudy, and, you know, some stuff in the third act maybe didn't quite do it for me as much as some of his other works, but... Overall, I very much enjoyed myself at the movies last night when I saw it. I think there were two major elements for me that kind of had disconnects for me. There were there were elements within the film that were overreaching usually what Edgar Wright goes for. I said this to you before we recorded that it's like simultaneously the best of Edgar Wright and the worst of Edgar Wright. Mm. In that it, there's this obsessive precision in the blocking, the choreography, uh, what, the mise-en-scene and what the audience is being shown and when. But also, there is a one-dimensionality to the story and the characters mm-hmm. that it's trying to reach out of. Like, because Edgar Wright's characters are almost always pretty one-dimensional, and most of the time that's fine, because he knows it and he's playing in that sandbox. And this is trying to go for a more complicated message, a more complicated character standpoint that I don't think it quite earns. Mm-hmm. The other thing that was a disconnect for me is that this film was marketed as a horror film, and it is certainly not. Absolutely not. I will say the the designs of some of the things that you see later into the film that have those horror thriller elements to them, genuinely unsettling and very well designed, but you are 100% right. This is like almost like a mystery above anything else, I would say. It's like a whis- mystery thriller. Yeah, it's, I, I would say it's a mystery thriller with, with uh, science fiction elements or time travel elements. That's not really and, a spoiler, I wouldn't say, because it's in the trailer. Right, yeah, of course. Uh, I would love to discuss some of the rules or lack thereof later. Um, now, that doesn't bother me so much. That's not a qualm I have with this film. Is that I, I I'll let it be loosey goosey with the rules because that's it's the vibe it's going for more than anything else. I didn't have the biggest problem with that part of it, but in my mind, comparing it to the last horror thriller mystery that I saw recently, *Malignant*, and how okay I was with uh, those rules being a little more lax, the way they were kind of setting up the hard and fast rules in this movie that we had to follow without question. I was kind of getting a little bogged down in, not to say that was like my biggest problem at all, but especially in the, the final couple moments of the the end there, they kind of bring it all back, and I, I kind of sh- scratched my head as the credits rolled. The ending is something that we'll definitely have to discuss as <laughs> yeah. because there are some thoughts I have about that, or <laughs> questions more than thoughts. Very true. But yeah, overall, I think this is not Edgar Wright's strongest outing, but I am very glad to see him kind of evolving as a director. It has a lot less of that postmodern pastiche that Edgar Wright is known for. Mm. It's more its own thing, which I really appreciated. Not that it certainly isn't relying on iconography from specific eras and specific films and things like that, but I like that it was stepping 
out of the Edgar Wright pastiche mode that he usually operates in. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely, you know, familiar but fresh, I would say. Like, definitely not completely abandoning any of his very famous and specific choices by any means, but, like, deviating enough that it felt like we were getting into some new territory here. I think that, you know, every film that he makes kind of steps more and more out of the Edgar Wright box, because you've got the Cornetto Mm. trilogy, which are very specific genre films, almost parodies of, I mean, Shaun of the Dead's literally a parody, but they're all kind of parodies of these these genres, and they have this hyper-tight editing, hyper-tight camera work Mm -hmm. with this real focus on lining up with music and the rhythm of dialogue and stuff like that, the cartoony zooms and sound effects and things, which he continues into Scott Pilgrim. Then when you get into Baby Driver, that's where he finally started kind of stepping out of that a little bit. You still have the obvious, the precision editing, the precision camera work, the the over-reliance on music, or not over-reliance, but the diegetic reliance on that music becoming more and more throughout, like, the jukebox stuff in the pubs in the Cornetto trilogy moving on to, like, the band in Scott Pilgrim moving on to the records in Soho being, like, the key to a couple of very important things in in the film. Yeah. But I think the thing that I admired the most about Soho as Edgar Wright's evolution as a filmmaker is that he's gotten less and less eager to point out what he's doing. Sure, yeah. That there's still the synchronization of the music, and the music plays a really important role in this film, but they've kind of abandoned a lot of the more cartoony elements of an Edgar Wright film, like those quick zooms, those funny sound effects. Even the the editing, while I'm sure very intentional, is not so blatantly synced up with the music and stuff like that yeah for sure and it makes you feel you know more immersed i'd say edgar wright films are a spectacle most of the time but it seems like he's trying to get the general audiences more immersed in his films with last night in soho yeah i would completely agree with that and i i would say he's doing a very bang up job with that if not anything else i think from what I took away overall is that I'm still excited to go see an Edgar Wright movie when it comes out. And the more he's experimenting with, you know, different forms and evolving his own style, I think, you know, we're we're never really going to be that disappointed, even if we are feeling like in here there are some inconsistencies. Totally. And I still really like the performances. Um, Thomas and McKenzie, Anya Taylor-Joy, Matt Smith... Terrence Stamp, Diana Rigg, all doing a bang-up job. Like I just said, we were moving away from pastiche, but all of them are doing fun genre pastiche things yeah. in them. Specifically, Ani Taylor-Joy and Thomas and McKenzie, who I think both their characters could have been archetypical kind of rehashes of other types of almost Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Yeah, yeah. I think both of their performances transcend the that role. Yeah, completely agreed. They were both like individually very well done and in tandem together when they are kind of it, you know, the way they are on screen together and kind of how their characters interact. I thought it was incredibly well done and I want to see both of them in more stuff. I think Anya Taylor-Joy is is fantastic. I want to see her I guess She's just a scream, modern scream queen, horror thriller person. I, I guess I just want more of those. I guess she, yeah, because she did The Witch, she did Split, she did this. Well, again, which isn't really a horror, but it's... But, like, it, you know, on the on that level-ish. Yeah. But what do you say? Do you want to jump into the meat of all this? I, I, I would like to hear your specific thoughts. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's mark spoilers. Let's official spoiler threshold for Last Night in Soho, starting right now. Yeah, let's talk about the third act reveal that Annie Taylor-Joy's character Sandy from the 1960s, who our time-traveling character thinks has been murdered, it has not been murdered and is in fact a serial killer. Yeah. I, yeah, play, I That's Diana Rigg, um, also, her landlady. She's great. I feel like the lack of screen time, any lack of clues or hints... That the landlady was her all along. I feel like 
the emphasis on Ellie's mother having been there years before never really I thought that was going to fold into the landlady or the old the old creepy man who she thinks is Jack for a while. The thing is, I think the mother is a more thematic presence. Maybe sure, a red sure. herring intentionally, but I think it's just this idea because obviously this film uh it not subtly at all is about uh female generational trauma and sexual assault. I yeah, I fully wasn't really expecting that walking in either, if I'm being honest, but and it is fine at it, I guess. It's not it feels a little self-congratulatory and sophomoric. It's a very surface level like men bad thing, which is I mean it's completely fair and valid. Sure, yeah, but there's also a few moments where they're like they I get a little whiplash. There's a moment where these ghostly figures who have been fully like attacking, grabbing, holding down Ellie are like, We're the victims. Style. Yeah, Ghostbuster style. They're like, Save us, we're the victims here, please, we're the tortured but then souls. The way they do that is they hand her the phone, right? But yeah. she doesn't take it. So I, yeah, ultimately, is that it's... her refusing to save them? Because that's when she turns to Sandy and is like, I understand why you did it. And that's the other thing. I was like, oh yeah, if I was Ellie, I'd let this old serial killer lady be. I don't care that she killed those guys 50 years ago. I'll I'll leave. That's fine. And then she tried to poison him and stab the boyfriend. Yep. I, I immediately was like, oh, we're supposed to maybe like the old lady. I was like, yeah, sure, maybe. Maybe we're supposed to like these ghosts. Yeah, maybe not as much, but then no. in the end, it's just kind of all literally up in flames. Yeah, the messaging gets confusing at the end there. I think the reveal is very well done. I like the conversation where Sandy turns into young Sandy, Ani Taylor-Joy. Yeah, the, for sure. In the burning house. The love story is nothing, huh? Oh, yeah. They kind of used him for like a strange, almost race baity kind of misunderstanding in the in the bedroom when she's having a vision oh. like he's attacking her and then yeah that's pretty much his entire function in that movie besides like being the one guy who's not a complete jerk to her in the school she's going to you were also mentioning that there were no clues that diana rig was sandy i think it was just so obvious that if there had been any more clues it would have been too much. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, w I guess maybe I was looking for more of a complex twist that I was kind of overlooking more of what was right in front of me. Okay, the options going in to me were either her grandmother is Sandy or Diana Rigg is Sandy. Those were our I options. was leaning more towards the grandmother was Sandy because she was given the whole, like, you don't know what it's like in the city, men are horrible, and... She could obviously feel her mother's stuff. Maybe she could feel her grandmother's stuff. I don't know. I also thought maybe the mom was going to have been a tenant in the same room. but That too? That's another, I think, maybe intentional red herring. Especially when uh, the butler from Night at the... Not Night at the Museum. The butler from the Haunted Mansion is like, Who was your mother? I'm just experiencing... Speaking of whiplash... <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot at your Stamp right. <laughs> being the butler, the butler from the Haunted Mansion. Yeah. He says, he's not even he says Chancellor Hell. Valorum to you, Seamus. <laughs> no, or, I didn't. I didn't recognize him as Chancellor Valorum before I recognized him as the Butler in the Haunted Mansion. My soul. <laughs> I'll forget his name in ten minutes' time. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> this script needed another pass, man. It, the I think reveals so. don't work as well as they want to. The messaging is muddled at best. I liked the characters, but only two or three of them felt really fleshed out in any meaningful way. Only two of them, because it's Sandy and uh, Eloise are the only ones that feel fleshed out to yeah, me. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, do I wish there was more Jocasta on screen? Probably not. I No, because she's, absolutely... again, she's so one-dimensional. Yeah, it's if, if there's going to... Also, literally never, not once, in any moment at the end, does she actually get redeemed, get punished, literally anything. She gives her, like, a smirk as she finishes her fashion show with the dress that looks so much uglier than the one that Anya Taylor-Joy wears Yeah, in the flashbacks. It, I mean, Edgar Wright, 
I alluded to this in our non-spoilers, has a certain what's on the box is what you get mentality to his filmmaking. Mm. I think Baby Driver is a relatively simple morality play that's just executed really entertainingly. Sure. And I don't mind that about his films. Edgar Wright's protagonists are often these, like, hyper-compassionate people. That's almost like their superpower, and I really appreciate that about his filmmaking, is that there is a kindness behind them. Especially this movie in Baby Driver. Hot Fuzz is another one, I think. Yeah, yeah. Where his characters, his protagonists, are able to overcome whatever they're going through and get their happy ending because of their understanding and their willingness to to understand other people and listen to other people that uh spoilers for baby driver and hot fuzz coming up real fast um (laughs) that baby driver you know he actually goes to prison willingly he's like yeah i'm a criminal i did the wrong thing i hurt people i'm gonna pay my penance for that so that i can live the life i want to live with the woman i love similar thing to hot fuzz less so sacrificially but that he is a man that is no matter how annoying people are no matter how how mean they are to him that he has a steadfast moral code that he obeys even when it would be easier and make his life better to to not have that compassion for those for the victims and mm, yeah. right and i like that this film is following through on that theme where she understands sandy she's like empathically linked with Mm -hmm. sandy and is able to forgive her is able to move on the messaging it just isn't quite there because it is this more complicated issue than like i'm a getaway driver in a bank robbery and i go to prison yeah what we have here is is very because we all we have that empathic link with sandy the old sandy that lives downstairs and there are ways for them to have navigated that in a little more of a morally complex way because what what is eloise trying to do the entire movie if not like get justice for sandy and then it just quick flip turns around sandy's like all of a sudden an unjustified i don't know i guess it wasn't justified per se but she was in a situation where she was escaping she was ripping and clawing her way out to a life that she could live without without being under the thumb of Matt Smith and all these other men and then she just I don't know. I it really does lose it for me, especially with the the very last shot of the movie itself with Eloise still able to see is she seeing herself as her or is she fully interacting with the spirit of Sandy? Like there are post mortem ways Sandy. to interpret this. I was I was trying to dissect <laughs> this yesterday on my way home from the movie the entire ending sequence from when Eloise fades to black in the ambulance to the last shot of the film, which are one, like her mother, Eloise is able to see the spirit of Sandy that, that plain and simple, right? Like that they're almost like a, like twisted Coco (laughs) where, (laughs) um, where these two people, uh, one dead, one living, uh, are separated not only by that, but by generations, but are still linked. Sure, sure. There is the second option, which is that it's kind of this weird, like, Sandy is a part of Eloise now. Sure, like, they're, okay. Like, that she carries Sandy in her, and that her influence is on her. Okay, and got that. And then the, like, extrapolation of that, which is, I think, why I say the entire ending sequence, because, okay... If we break it down, Eloise is in the ambulance while Sandy is upstairs dying. Okay. Eloise, it fades to black on Eloise in the ambulance. The next image we see is the op- is like just light in a black void with the silhouette of a woman who appears to be Sandy. Right. It's not... But then we transition, like, we do the whole fashion show thing, and then at the very end, you see Eloise's entire reflection as Sandy. Not Sandy standing behind her, not Sandy yeah, with her, but her, which 
you could have the subtext of, and I do not interpret it this way, but I do think it could be interpreted this way, that the, the fade to black is Eloise losing her consciousness and Sandy possessing her. Insidious style, just just using her as a vessel. I have not I, seen Insidious, I, I, but I believe you. Man, James Wan, how dare you? I know. We'll, we'll watch those, but the whole conceit of that is it's like it's a little boy in a coma, and these demons are fighting over which one of them will get to like use his body as a vessel. Sure. So something like that, and I can understand the logic behind that for this movie because, like you said, it's not like her mother standing behind her where she's like you know she does her little like tap on the mirror thing to do the final moment of the film and i guess i fall into the camp of like the spirit of old sandy is maybe allowing her to still go to the past but not scary pimp doctor who past where she's like having a fun time at the clubs I really just don't know See, what to make of it's, the ending. It's very, it's very up in the air, and maybe some people will say like, "That's the G. You got to interpret what that means." But like, it's it. No, no, we don't. I would like to be told the conclusion <laughs> to this James movie. Is like, I don't want any subtext in my movies. I'll I don't take, want to infer anything. <laughs> hey, when the whole when the whole messaging has been absolutely back and forth for two out of the three acts of this movie i i need a little concrete ending for something like that you yeah know? there's not a lot of clarity in the ending i think you're exactly right because you're right about the rules not really being established and also the thematics are messy at best oh uh, and like i said before still i enjoyed this movie thoroughly i would maybe put it on the lowest rung of my Edgar Wright totem pole, or the highest rung, however that works, you know what I mean? Like, I think I would maybe watch any of the Cornettos, Scott Pilgrim, or Baby Driver before I would go do Soho again. I'm very curious to see where Wright goes after this. I'd love to see him do a proper horror movie. Me too! Make it just, like, a straight-up, like, ghost demon, something that isn't as morally weird as, like, the virtual ghost alter ego life of an old serial killer woman also the third act the the end of the second act going in the third act of this movie there is too much of her seeing the ghosty guys and then just screaming and running away (laughs) yeah it's too long it's this movie needed to lose 15 minutes somewhere and that was most of it i'd say I agree. There, it was a lot of that for zero payoff in the end of, like, she almost stabs Jocasta in the face with a pair of scissors, which I thought she was definitely going to do and I would have loved, but... They also, with how little Jocasta ultimately la- matters in this movie, they definitely could have cut a lot of her stuff at the beginning because they spent so much time establishing her. The first act of this movie is just reestablishing stuff over and over and over again. I needed to go to the bathroom at the beginning of this movie. (laughs) And I kept waiting for the break into Act 2 to happen, and it just kept not happening. It just just kept... Five scenes in a row of her getting bullied by other adults in London. Exactly. And it's just like, okay, guess I'm waiting for this, and then she finally got the apartment. (laughs) I was like, okay, better hustle. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Before we continue on from things that took up way too much time that ultimately led nowhere. Oh, true to my word, I forgot the guy's name. Lindsay the Cop. Good lord. Terrence what a... Stamp. Terrence Stamp. If they did literally any work besides a 10 second uh, conversation between the young version of him and uh, Sandy in the past. Yeah, what and, if like, he'd actually had like, a plot any of or that? something? I didn't think he was Jack from the start how dumb would that have been if that guy was just jack walking around yeah i wish that they had given the cop more to do in the 60s so that exactly we cared that he, because who cares that he's a cop who who cares about that character at all again um yeah it's unless script. we had something to care about previously we're just supposed to be generally suspicious for no reason. For absolutely no reason. Yeah. I mean, he's got some good, um, vaguely threatening lines that I enjoyed. Like, really, it's like an old-fashioned Vincent Price role of just, like, being yeah. there and being <laughs> yeah. creepy. Oh, uh, yeah. I, there, there's plenty of good stuff, too, in their confrontation together where he's like, ah, I kept the girls in line, one might say. And then they just kill him. They kill him so immediately after he starts to, like, heat up. 
Yeah, and also th- how telegraphed it is that he's about to get hit by a car is really annoying. <laughs> yeah, for real. So that coming a mile away. Was it even the same cabbie who was, like, being a creep? Or did that guy never show up again either? No, that guy never showed up. Which, I didn't mind that, because that introduces thematically this idea, like, immediately, right? Sure, yeah, that's true. Of that I... London is this place full of creepy men doing creepy things, and... I think that part of the messaging was actually working. Overall, the male gaze in this film was very well portrayed. It's just when you get to the end with the twist that it becomes a little bit more hazy about, like, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, it's just a full movie of this beautiful and talented woman is getting absolutely abused by this, you know, group of terrible, terrible people, and then she is still... She is still the villain in the end for having taken control of that and, yeah, through violence, sure, but, I don't know, confusing to say the least. I will say this for Edgar Wright, I like that there's not an easy answer presented in the film. Mm -hmm. That even though we were just saying how it's a little aggravating that he is trying to simplify this very complex issue, that... I like that you and I are still sitting here talking about it thematically, which I've never done with an Edgar Wright movie before. It shows an evolution in his skill as a writer and director. Yeah, that, again, that just goes back to our continued excitement for what he will put out in the future. I mean, I'll say it a million times, this movie wasn't my favorite, but still genuinely like a good film, regardless of any of the criticisms we're bringing up now. I, I would still rewatch it on any, any given day. Well, I can tell my dad that he can actually see it because he was pretty worried about he was like, I will not oh, be seeing yeah. that movie. And I'm like, yeah, no, it'll be nothing fine. To worry about. Yeah. <laughs> if he's scared of, I don't know, I forget what those guys are called in Doctor Who. There's a Doctor they Who They look exactly villain. like those things from Doctor Who. I know yeah, exactly the what Yeah, the alien about. suit guys who make you forget stuff. Yeah. They also look a little like the gentleman from Buffy. Do not get that reference. Yeah, I know, but somebody probably does. Somebody will. Somebody will pick up that pop culture reference. Should we move on to our pop culture reference? I think that's a great transition, Gary. Let's do it. Fittingly, for today's pop culture reference, we're going to be talking about Soho. Central to the plot and tone of today's main segment, Soho is a London neighborhood in the West End, near the theater district and the iconic Piccadilly Circus. While the area has a well-established history dating back centuries, it is primarily known for its nightlife, sex work, and independent film industry in the mid-20th century. While the neighborhood has undergone significant gentrification in the period since the 1980s, it is still a center of the London art scene and is a huge bastion for London's nightlife. Film companies like 20th Century Fox have office space in Soho, along with the post-production branches of famed London studios Pinewood and Shepperton. The music industry also has a large presence in Soho, holding recording studios utilized by icons such as The Beatles, Queen, David Bowie, and Elton John. It is also home to the iconic music venues of Two Eyes, Coffee Bar, The Marquee Club, and Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. With the addition of local playhouses and theaters like the Soho Theater and the Windmill Theater, it was estimated in 2010 that up to 23% of Soho residents were employed in the creative industries. Soho is still very much a London cultural center and referenced in much British and international media, such as Edgar Wright's new film, Last Night in Soho. You've, you've actually been to Soho, have you not? You, you've done a little party in around those parts? I have. When I was uh, on a study abroad in London, I was in Bloomsbury, which is right near Soho. And I went to, you know, Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club and, and stuff like that. Nice. Very nice. How, how did, what was, like, the representation of that area like in the movie compared to, per, compared to real life? Well, like, the contemporary representation of Soho. Yeah, 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 like... Nice, gentrified party area in London. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, pretty accurate. All right, all right. I mean, it's also interesting because in London, everything closes so early. So Soho's the only place that we really went that things were open past 10 p.m. Like, Jeez, we went to really the that 1 a.m. show at Ronnie Scott's, right? Oh, tight, Okay. It's really it's also nice because it was so close to us. I'm sure there are other nightlife districts in London, but since we were so close to Soho, that's where we would go over there on a, on the tube or just walking. Well, I would definitely like to go with you sometime. We'll grab a pint of numbers or whatever whatever he ordered. I don't know yeah. what that actually is, but yeah, just a quick skip across the pond for us, Seamus. Real, th- just a little pop culture. Real easy. Trip. When we do our Soho live show uh, in a couple months, we'll, <laughs> we'll 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 go hit up all the spots. Perfect. Yeah, easy peasy. <laughs> 
But what do you say we move on to our rec center for today, Garrett? Let's do it, Seamus. Now it's time to save the rec center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. I've teased you a little bit with this, uh, Garrett, over the last couple days. I had I had myself a little sick day off, and I decided to go on the nostalgia train and rewatch Batman Forever, a five star movie that is three stars because it's absolutely terrible, <laughs> and it is as wacky and stupid as you remember. Uh, you get two incredible actors, I would say, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey, both playing different characters while also trying to be the Joker. And you have uh, Chris O'Donnell as a 16-year-old that looks 30. And it's just the wildest thing ever. I I almost want to say, like, Val Kilmer is the Andrew Garfield of this superhero thing. Kind of, maybe a little underrated, but mostly forgotten for decent reason. And it's just, like, a funny, stupid blast. Uh, I, I watched it seconds after I rapped. Black Widow on Disney Plus, as you notice, that is not my rec center, and I just, I just wanted some <laughs> wacky, fun superhero comic book BS that wasn't going to be so bogged down in the death of Scarlett Johansson. So, if you have any nostalgia towards it, it's hilarious to watch again, and if you've never seen it, it's better than Batfleck. So, give it a shot. I watched that for the first time on ABC Family when oh, I was probably yeah. twelve. On Halloween, I was alone. I was oh. home alone on Halloween, and that's what I watched. That's awesome, though. That's a Halloween movie. That, that, that there's a Halloween part where kids are trick or treating at Wayne Manor. Yes, they are. It's absolutely ridiculous, but I mean, you got the nostalgia part of it down. You just got to do a rewatch now and just groan your way through all the terrible and weirdly sexual additions that Joel Schumacher just had to put in there. <laughs> I mean. Are we going to sit here and pretend that the Tim Burton Batman isn't also hypersexual? Did he have bat nipples? That was a no, I thing. Mean, like, <laughs> are you saying nipples are inherently sexual, Seamus? Um, <laughs> I don't know. When you make it black, rubber, like molded ass, abs, and nipples for Val Kilmer. I don't know, man. I thought the nipples were only in Batman and Robin. Are they also I, in Batman Forever? I, I think they're more pronounced in Batman and Robin, but I believe that... I, I made sure I looked specifically I, when I, I was watching the other day. Batman. <laughs> Val, Val Kilmer's Kilmer. bat nipples. He, oh, yeah, he totally does. You're right. Yeah, right? There's a scene where he goes to uh, Chase Meridian, Dr. Chase Meridian's apartment at midnight to, like, seduce her as Batman. And she's like, oh, this body. But, like, a scene before, Val Kilmer has no bat suit on, and he's like... He's not, like, out of shape, but he's far from the weird sculpted abs that are on his bat suit. The thing that probably made the biggest impact on me uh, being as young as I was was, well, one, the Riddler. Um, oh, yeah. But other than that, it was definitely Chase Meridian, which... <laughs> um, <laughs> I the think most the, sexually aggressive woman in Gotham City. Like, and the fact that she's such a freak for the bat suit specifically. <laughs> she, like, she, she flips on the bat signal when she gets horny in that movie. She yeah. go, breaks into the police department to do that. <laughs> it's bizarre. <laughs> it's so weird. But I will say nothing beats the super crazy looking CGI Gotham City that those movies have. It, it just looks awesome and I love it. It's a. I, I'll have to revisit it now. I've got to <laughs> yeah. revisit it. Shameless. It's so bizarre. I'll, I'll I'll rewatch it with you. I have got the Blu-rays. Why don't we just do all four of them? That would be great. That would be a blast. I would love that. But until we do that marathon for the show, what do you got for this week's rec center, Garrett? Yeah, my rec center this week in preparation for French Dispatch, which I still have not seen. A couple of buddies and I rewatched. The Grand Budapest Hotel. Ooh, yeah. And I think no matter where you stand on Wes Anderson's filmography and his style, that is just an absolute triumph of a film. I consider it his personal opus. I think it's tremendous. Rafe Fiennes, Tony Revolori, Saoirse Ronan are all so charming and so funny. And it's a great implementation of Anderson's style, but also a film that would be compelling without it, I think. Like, that the story and the characters are strong enough that if another filmmaker directed that script, 
it certainly wouldn't be as good, but it would still be a compelling story that I would be invested in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you that personally I haven't seen all of his incredible filmography, but of what I have seen, I think the Grand Budapest Hotel is one of, if not his best work, I would say my favorite, one of my favorite movies that I've seen in the last, God, when did that movie come out? That was way longer ago than I think, wasn't it? 2015, 2016 maybe? Yeah, sure, like the last five years, I had a blast watching that for sure. It's charming and funny and genuinely heartbreaking in a lot of places that I didn't think I would be getting it from in such a whimsical setup. Twenty four. All right, of the last seven or eight years, whatever that number <laughs> is, so long ago, but, you know, again, hilarious, heartwarming, looks gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. I guess I could say that about every every one of those yeah. movies. I don't know. Its fluctuating aspect ratios actually serve a purpose, which yeah, I like. yeah. There's all those the, the the layers of narrative over each other that like, feel so natural in the way they can weave into and out of each other. Oh, it, it's it. a very literary film, yes. mostly because the framing device is a book. Yo, oh, right, yeah. Oh man, I might I might rewatch that today. I might I might give that another shot because it's been like I said it's been so long but I love that movie and on your on your personal rec I think it might be good because I also got very giddy pumped watching that uh, French Dispatch trailer in front of the movie last night. But that wraps us up for this week's episode of Pop Culture Reference. If you want to reach the show, you can tweet us at PCR underscore podcast, find us on Instagram at PCR underscore podcast, and follow us on TikTok at PCR underscore podcast. You can email us at popculturereferencepod at gmail.com, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, leave us a like, a review, a rating on whatever platform you're listening to. It really helps the show out. Next week, we're going to be covering... Did we decide we're doing The Harder They Fall, Seamus? I think let's pull the trigger on it, man. I'm I'm a lot more excited for that than Eternals anyway, so I think that's the move. So we'll we'll cover Eternals at some point, probably when it gets put on Disney+. Plus. We'll do um, an Eternals Shang Chi double up episode or something. That would actually be kind of fun. We should probably I do think that. that. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, the harder they fall, it's coming to Netflix. Watch it. Listen to our episode next week. I'm really excited about it. Me too, man. I'm very much looking forward to it. Adios, amigos. Oh.